uh, what we're going through is the story, and it's, uh, I keep getting uh, some, some comments about how well uh, this is being received and how easy it is to kind of get through and to kind of keep people uh, going through Scripture, and that's the plan, and that's the hope that we have. Uh, my kids have been uh, enjoying reading that, and I've shared some of the questions that they have with you, and uh, it is always interesting to see kind of what they pick up and pick out of a, uh, a certain story. Last week, if you remember, we talked about the Israelites wandering in the desert. Uh, we talked about, really, how our church is in a state of wandering right now. Well, we moved from Baytown into Mont Bellevue, and we, we've seen this as a, a temporary space as we buy land and um, <coughs> begin to build. But right now, we're kind of in, in the midst of the journey, right? You know, the part of the part of life you'd like to skip by and get to the end, to get to those next things, to the fun things. They talked about uh, my favorite superpower, if I could choose one, which apparently was my son's, as he shouted out, uh, but just to be able to teleport. You know, those of you who live far from your family, you could use that for good, couldn't you? Hey, I'm going to have lunch with mom. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go have dinner with the kids tonight. But immediately after, we, after services last week, on the way home, Evan was talking. He said, you know what? And he started mentioning things he could take without anybody knowing. I said, listen, that's why we can't teleport right there. I said, I have raised you to be a good kid, and you're already thinking about nobody would catch me. I said, can you imagine somebody who has been raised uh, with evil intention? And that's why we can't do that. But the big point last week was that we need to slow down and, and be able to accept, and even enjoy the journey. That if we're so focused on the destination, we're going to miss all of the blessings that come within the journey. Now, we all know, because we've lived long enough, that part of the journey a lot of times is not all roses and, and sunshine, right? Part of the journey is that hard part of Scripture that talks about perseverance, yeah, we want to we talk about Jeremiah 29, 11, and the Lord has plans to, to bless you and to prosper you and all these things. And, and then if you just read right there, it says it's going to be 70 years before that happens. But in the meantime, what are we doing? In the story of Joshua this week, this is said over and over, uh, and something that I'm sure stuck out to you as you read, now Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, because everything's going to go your way, and everything's going to be smooth sailing. So you just take that courage into that easy sailing, right? You be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, because you are strong, and you're a great individual. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. That's how you can be strong and courageous. Not because I'm great, and man, I've been, I've been raised in a certain way, and I've got all the answers. No, we are strong and courageous because God is faithful and he goes with us. I think one of the things as we think about the, the blessing that was the land God gave the Israelites. I think often when we think of blessings in our own lives, what we think about is all of a sudden something happens in our life. Again, cutting out that journey. That the blessing somehow, for me to feel blessed, I need to just be given something kind of free of charge, kind of like uh, winning the lottery type of thing. One minute I don't have anything, the next minute I have to change my phone number because all of y'all want to call me and get my money now, right? <laughs> but the blessings that God continually gives his people are, are things where they have to go through a, a journey. He's not telling Joshua to be strong and courageous because nothing's ever going to go wrong, is it? Right? He's telling him because life is going to come at you. Does anybody know that this morning? <laughs> I mean, if, if you follow uh, uh, Dave Ramsey, and I know some of you do, uh, he talks about financially uh, Murphy's Law. Do you know what Murphy's Law is? If something can go wrong, it will go wrong. 
We have other we have other ideas within our society, within our culture. Things happen in threes, right? Because when life happens, it seems to just keep coming at you. And so the, the reason that God is telling Joshua, be strong and courageous, because some days it's going to feel like maybe God's not going with me. Some days it's going to feel like I'm out here on an island by myself. What am I doing? But God says, be strong and courageous because I am going with you. Now, that's real easy to roll off the tongue, but it's very hard in the moment, isn't it? Very hard in the moment when that sickness happens or your family member passes away or life, right? It's easy to get up and read this, but it's, it's hard in practice to say, all right, God, I know you're there and you're walking with me and I walk with a courage. That's why we have to come and we have to continually remind ourselves not only about the, the story of Scripture, but the story of our own lives. That, that moment where we look back, we're able to look at the way God has blessed me before. The way I remember that time where I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if there was an end to that dark tunnel I felt like I was in. But on this side of it, I know that God was faithful. And we need to be reminded of that. God teaches the Israelites a lot of uh, uh, good, uh, good things throughout this story. And I know we... Uh, if you had the adult version, uh, there was a lot in there, a lot of different episodes. But in Joshua 23, verses 14 through 16, this is this. Now, I am about to go the way of all the earth, as Joshua talking. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as all good things the Lord your God has promised you have come to you, so he will bring on you all the evil things he has threatened until the Lord your God has destroyed you from the good land he has given you. We should end every service with that right there, shouldn't we? <laughs> if you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods, is a key here in all of this to understand it, and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you. And you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. Now, I, I picked this scripture out of, out of so many this week because it, it, it's kind of a, it kind of shows us where we can be mentally in all of this. That we can accept the blessings at times and then walk away from God, can we not? Sometimes it's easy to accept the blessings and be happy with God then, but when things are going wrong, instantly I'm going to turn away from God. Or when the blessings come, I no longer attribute them to God, but attribute them to myself. Because again, I am so awesome, aren't you? <laughs> and this is one of the things that I think Scripture does so well is just kind of show us how humanity operates. I want to pray to God that I, I get this job. I want to pray to God that I'm able to pass this test, to be able to get this degree. And once I have those things, I feel like it's all me. That I have done the work. Here in uh, 24, verse 11 through 13, listen to this reminder as God speaks here. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you as did also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, Jebusites, but I gave them into your hand. I, that's the focus here, I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. As you think about the accomplishments of your life, if you think about the way that uh, you sit here today, the jobs that you've had, the way you've gotten through school, all the things you have done to be where you are today, where is your focus? Because it's real easy for me, I don't know about it for you guys, to feel in the moment if I'm kind of uh, stepping away from God and I don't really mentally know it, but to, to kind of take credit for that. 
to really step back and say, man, John, you've got it going on. I know y'all tell me that every week. I just can't get out of here from all y'all saying. And I'll, I'll say this about this scripture. Uh, I think ministry is an exercise in this line of thinking every single week, is it not? Because the sermon, I think, I'm going to knock y'all socks off. I get in here, and most of you are asleep. And oh, only amens are the ones I ask for. It's like, well, amen? Does that mean we go to lunch? I was not at all there for a second. And so, you know, sometimes that just works that way, right? I put in all this effort, and so this should pay off because I did it, right? And so God tends to humble us. I don't know if you know this, but uh, the, the lessons that I have given and I have felt like and I offered the invitation, I've got a straight shot to the door and I should take it right now, <laughs> is the lesson that someone comes up crying saying, man, I needed to hear that today. And I know within my soul it didn't have anything to do with me. That God did it. Amen. And as Christians, we ought to operate that way. That every single blessing that is in our lives right now at this time does not come from me. Just saying yes to God that I will go with you does not mean you made that happen. You give that blessing you give that to God because he's the one that made it happen. And I love this reminder right here. Verse 13 says, So I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. But God, weren't we the ones that marched around the walls of Jericho? How much of that marching do you think had anything to do with those walls falling down? How much of that great trumpet playing do you think had anything to do with those walls falling down? I don't know. How many of you are reading to your kids or grandkids through the story right now? Got a few of you? Let me encourage you to add in the sound effects. <laughs> Y'all wouldn't believe the sound those trumpets made when they <laughs> marched around and blew. But can't you imagine being on this side of all the battles, all those names of, of peoples and kings that are now gone? Would you sit there and say, my goodness, what a great military we have? We would, wouldn't we? If we weren't reminded, everything comes from God. Is that the credit you give in your life? Joshua 24, just the uh, next few verses here, starting in verse 14. He says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Again, this is Joshua just talking to his people, knowing he's, he's not long for this world. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But... If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors, <clears throat> whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. I think this is the scripture we need to have in our house. As for me and my people, we choose to serve the Lord. And that may sound like a kind of a flippant thing in, in uh, class this morning, and Paul, I'm going to say it again, I'm sorry. Um, we were talking about attitudes and, and kind of things that, attitudes and actions that define us as Christians. And we, we named off some things, and I, I just mentioned that in the past, we have kind of, because spiritual things are hard to quantify, aren't they? I mean, you can sit here every week, and I have no idea there's not a meter above your head, coach, that's saying spiritual growth, kind of waning this week, going up, okay, 
Okay. And so because of that, we've counted some weird things, and one of the things we have counted is attendance. As if, as if the position of your rear end on these seats makes you a faithful member of the body of Christ. But what makes you a faithful member of the body of Christ is you giving your life to him. And what comes with that is giving him all the credit and all the glory for all the ways you have been blessed. I've encouraged you for the last few weeks to honor God, to honor all the blessings that you have been given. From the hot shower you took this morning, from the ability just to get here this morning. I have been fighting a head cold for, it feels like a month now. And I can breathe this morning and thank God for that. And as I look around the room, I see people that have had different things going on in their lives. But you're here right now today. Thank God for that. Blessings that come only from him. Now we know as we read through scripture that when Joshua says this, or if we claim this, that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, that that doesn't mean that your life is just going to be filled with cash and cars. I was driving one day um, back in Arkansas, and in the southwest corner of the state, instead of giving us like news stations and things like that from Little Rock, which is the capital, we got all of our news from Louisiana. Ooh. <laughs> the McCartneys aren't here. I don't, I'm sure the rest of you are from Louisiana. But as I was driving around one day, I, I caught a, a part of a radio station that was talking about this, and like, and the whole sermon was how God wants you to have a bigger house. How God wants you to have a nicer car. And I thought, maybe like Evan did last week, where's the scripture reference for this? Because often we think, I'm following God, and so God, you owe me. We wouldn't say that. But God says, I'm going to bless you. Again, the Jeremiah 29, 11 theology that God just wants you to have these blessings and we kind of fill in the blanks as to what those are. And if God, you're not filling in all those blanks, I don't feel blessed anymore. I make it a habit as we pray with the boys to <coughs> mention individual blessings that we have been given throughout the week. Because sometimes the roof over our head is something we don't even think about, isn't it? So many people out there suffering, struggling. And here we are thinking, my goodness, God, you haven't blessed my life sitting in a house that's cooled and heated, taking showers that we can control the temperature on. Ladies, lava hot, I'm sure, if you're anything like my wife. <laughs> For me, she said, uh, mine's pretty hot, but she says it is, there's just no heat to it. But as we look around in our lives, so many ways that God has blessed us through this. But again, we give him the glory and the credit. The story this week is filled with things that probably make us uncomfortable at times. Military conquests, killing people that we don't know all the things they have done. We get little snippets of how they have turned from God, and they are associated with idols and all of these things, and we don't know what to do with that. But one of the thing, one of the main teaching points I got out of this this week is the story of Rahab. Now, I doubt Rahab, as she existed, wanted to be known in perpetuity as Rahab the prostitute. Why not Rahab the converted? But Rahab's story, it really came to life for me one day. We were living in Texarkana, and the church there decided to start helping out. There was already a homeless ministry in our town. I had no idea, but there were like 300 homeless people in our town. I had no clue. And we just came alongside this ministry to help fill in a, a gap to, to feed and to, to minister to these people. And I think as our, one of our first couple of trips that we went down, uh, I was introduced to a woman who they all lived, just kind of like you see around here, you know, very wooded areas, 
lot of times you don't even know it's there until somebody tells you, and you're like, oh, there's a tent. But we went down with this woman, and uh, uh, the leader of the ministry said, well, she's a prostitute. And my gut reaction, probably like a lot of you, if you were in that situation, is, oh, no. She did that to survive. But this lady, as she showed us around, showed us her, her tent on top, of, on top of some crates, on top of some pallets with a, uh, I can just visualize right now the, uh, the quilt that was over this tent. And she had this dog that she was taking care of. She, she can barely live on her own if she's taking care of a dog. I'm like, <laughs> but the whole time we were hanging out with this woman, she just kept quoting scripture. And I, had, I struggled with that. Because I still can't quote scripture like that. I could stand up here and use no notes all day long, but if we want to quote all over the place all the time, uh, um, no, let me, get my, let me get my notes out then. But this lady was just trying to live, and I had to wrestle with that. And you think, well, what are you saying? Well, what about Rahab? Rahab lived a life where apparently it was um, very common to see men coming and going out of her place of residence. Rahab lived a life that everybody knew what was going on, did they not? But when the spies came to visit, Rahab, Rahab had an option. What do I do now? Because I can only imagine, the scriptures don't tell us, but I can only imagine that giving up the spies might have been a lucrative deal. And I think about all the ways we kind of rectify the choices that we make in life. The way that we can think, you know what? God may be wanting to bless me with this money right now. I could turn these guys over and I'd use it for the Lord. And we struggle with the fact that the way that Rahab was righteous in the sight of God was by lying. But in this moment, she said, I have got to save these guys' lives. And just like with Rahab, and just like I, I see so many times here, in our culture, it is often the outsider who teaches us the greatest lesson. Because the, it is the outsider that tells the Israelites, we have heard what your God has done. And she's talking to people that were there. Or that their parents were there. And those same people lived through that and then decided what we need is a golden calf. What we need to do is assign this to someone else. And here is the outsider living a life that is questionable by any standards. Says, we have heard about your God. And because I have heard what your God has done, I want to be a part of that. And if you don't know this about Rahab, you need to mark it down right now. If you turn over to the genealogy of Jesus, you see the name Rahab. Because God and his power can accomplish anything. Amen. God and his power can accomplish anything. All we need to do is say yes. That's all. We don't need to look around and tell everybody how great we are. We can say, God, I'm on your side. Let's go. And that's a scary proposition, isn't it? Because God may ask you to do some things you're not comfortable with. God may ask you to talk to some people you're not. Uh -uh. But all it took with Rahab was to say yes. And the enemy to all of us is that doubt that creeps in about whether I'm good enough. Because nobody knows all the things I have done, God must not be able to forgive me or save me. And with that, we give Satan a foothold right into our brain, right into our very soul. In Scripture, had we right here in front of us, we could look down and see the name of a prostitute in the line of Jesus. Because God can. I told you, 
uh, I think two weeks ago that Evan, as we've read through this, some things we get to and he says, Dad, this is just hard to believe. And I love that honesty, to be honest with you. You know, you first hear your kids say to you, oh, no. Oh, you know, I like that. There are too many times we come to Scripture and we just go on like, like it's nothing. We don't wrestle with it, and I love that he's wrestling and trying to figure it out. What does this mean? I see myself as a student of, of really of life. You know that, don't you, Connie? We've had those conversations. I see myself as a student, and I love people who will just wrestle and see what this is all about. And that's what God asks us to do. Again, as we read uh, this morning, it isn't for just anything that God is ready to uh, get rid of these people. It isn't for anything that Joshua says, you just watch your P's and Q's and all of these things. It is when you turn away from God and you choose something else in your life as God that God says, okay, you've made your choice. And so we have a choice to make ourselves. Are we going to worship God or are we going to worship something else? Are we going to give him the credit for the blessings in our life or are we out here just doing it on our own strength? And so as a church, in the wandering phase, in the midst of the journey, what are we going to do? I asked you last week, should we just pack it in and go home? And everybody said no. Well, it's not good enough to say no. What's your attitude? What's your action going to be? How can you get involved? How can you make things happen with God's power? So if you have a relationship with God that is strained or disconnected, I want to encourage you to make that right this morning. If you want to begin that walk with him, let's do that right now. To see someone say, right now, as for me and my household, my family, we will serve the Lord. We can all draw encouragement from that. If you have any needs this morning, I'd love to pray with you, uh, but we're going to offer a song of invitation. Would you come and just stand and sing?